So today we are glad to have uh, Ram Pratap Singh, or RP as he likes to be called, and uh, and he is um, he's of course you know he's a pioneer where uh, where uh, you know sustainability is concerned, and he's one of the pioneer. He he runs a lodge by the name of uh, Mela Koti, uh, you know in um, in Chambal, and uh, he's one of the pioneers who's begun the tourism in the right. region. So, so welcome, uh, Ram. And and it's not just that. I mean, he has lots of other hats, and he's a diverse person. You know, who is uh, into uh, irresponsible tourism. He he runs uh, he's he runs an Indian school of nature. He's involved with Intac, and he works very closely with UP Tourism Promotion Board. And he's also, uh, you know, uh, honorary wildlife warden for the national. Chambal Sanctuary. These are just to name a few, but uh, we are here. I mean, uh, to hear him out, what, um, how he's made the difference and been the been the change. So over to you, Ram. To uh, you know, um, so um, he will share his presentation, and then we will, uh, you know, kind of uh, we will have a session from Akanksha. And uh, who's also we? I will give an introduction when we are just about to begin with her. And uh, right now, over to over to uh, Ram. Hmm. Thank you, Ritu, and uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, I'm I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to reach out to uh, the larger Toft community. And today, I'm going to do a run a short film to introduce the destination that is Chambal, and then that will be followed by a presentation which is uh, I've tried to build today's discussion uh, on a case study model where I'm, uh, the PowerPoint presentation sort of documents the journey uh, as we went along in, uh, building ecotourism in Chambal. So over the years, how uh, we brought in sustainability practices. And then, yes, as I was saying, I have used my engineering skills to quantify some of the impacts. Uh, positive or negative uh, with that uh, ecotourism operation uh, brings into the destination and the uh, wildlife around. And uh, so that's the pr process that I'm going to share with you. And I'll be very happy to answer uh, any questions related to the empirical data or the calculations that have gone into uh, creating uh, this uh, sustainability presentation. So first, I'll start with the film. I think there wouldn't be any sound in it, but I'll just uh, talk through it. Uh, That's the Chambal River, one of the cleanest rivers in north of India. Indian skimmers, the signature species. And here we are located between Yamuna and Chambal. And this is the lodge uh, called the Mela Koti, the Chambal Safari Lodge, spread over 52 acres of farm and forest. And at the core of it is Mela Koti, which is a heritage building. Uh, what used to be my great grandfather's office in the uh, colonial times. The 20 acre core of uh, the Chambal Safari Lodge has been rewilded, and a lot of birds and wildlife has come back to the lodge. The safaris on the Chambal River are operated uh, using boats. And the key species are gharials and uh, crocodiles, and also the Gangetic dolphin. And this is the a cultural site uh, on the Yamuna River, where we have 50 plus uh, Shiva temples from the 16th century. So having introduced the destination and the lodge, now I go on to my sustainability presentation. Right, so we started our journey in Chambal in the year 1999. And the first thing that Chambal was 
then known for was this. This was one of the biggest sustainability threats to anything around here. Forget about tourism. And the bandits rule. But the bigger threat was, was the tragic fact that the sandbanks of Chambal River were being mined extensively for to be used as a construction material. And the mafia was brazen enough to be killing senior police officers in broad daylight. And in the middle of all this, we sort of stepped in to bring in bird watching tourism to the area. And so the sustainability was at stake from uh, completely unimaginable quarters. And that brings me to the question that why was the sand being mined? So as you see in this picture, the fine sand uh, is, is, uh, can be used, is a very good construction material. But from the ecological and the environmental point of view, uh, this sand is where our resident wildlife uh, lays their eggs. Birds uh, make open nests. And this was all being destroyed by rampant mining. And also, this sand plays a very important role in uh, 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 it, uh, bringing the water table up in this region. So when we stepped in and uh, came in in 1999, the water table was going down by several feet every year. So the whole area was not just the wildlife, but the entire agriculture in the area's sustainability was at stake. So at that stage, when we uh, started bringing in tourists and uh, we were facing threats from various quarters, uh, we, uh, we tried to wean away uh, uh, people, local people who were working with the miners into tourism. And it was a long sustained uh, battle against the mining community. But today, very proudly, we can say that our part of Chambal is free from any kind of uh, uh, mining activities. So the next slide is about uh, the five pillars of sustainability. How do we measure sustainability? And there is air, water, land, community, and conservation. These are the five pillars. And one by one, we can look at them. So at Chambal, as you, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, is 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 we can see. Okay, and, yes, and it is okay. readable also, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so then I don't have to read out everything, but uh, at Chambal, we were uh, oh, in this twenty-five years. Uh, I calculated the carbon offset that we are creating, and that absolute carbon offset comes to about seven tons per annum. And if I divide that by the number of room nights that we do uh, every year. It comes to, so per room night, the carbon offset comes to roughly six and a half kilos. Now, there's a detailed calculation for this available at, towards the end of this presentation, and we can talk about it. But how this happened, if I can just uh, explain. So this was the Chambal Safari Lodge grounds in the year 1999. And at the se center, you can see the, the Mela Koti. And this is what it is today. So we've... Uh, this transformation of creating a, a woodland, a jungle, has created the carbon sink that offsets the carbon footprint of the traveler coming our way. Uh, we are energy sensitive in the sense we are using a hybrid uh, DG solar model, and we are planning to get to go, move 100% solar. And uh, so our in a, electricity consumption per room night is about 49 units. Now, the global norm for uh, non-urban properties in this context is about 100 uh, units. So we, we are well below the global norms uh, by judicious use of technology is what uh, has helped us achieve this. This is just a photograph of our solar facility. Uh, water uh, is a very, very important. I mean, when the traveler uh, comes in, uh, there's a huge footprint on the water. And uh, here are 52 acres of farm and forest is completely rainwater harvested. And uh, of course, in, on our farms, we are using drip irrigation and sprinkler, sprinkler irrigation systems. So out of the, uh, I mean, I'll go into detailed calculations later, but uh, we are uh, the net rainwater harvesting for us is about 42.79 million liters per annum. 
And that translates to something like 37,000 liters per room night. So a guest staying with us is actually contributing roughly 37,400 liters per room night. This is the photograph of our uh, rainwater harvesting sink pond, which is roughly about one acres. And the entire rainwater through a network of uh, channels and small ponds uh, gets diverted into this sink pond. And this has been dug to a certain depth where uh, it can sink in water uh, uh, very quickly. In a, in a matter of hours, the water, the, uh, the water sinks in. Uh, waste management practices, so as I said, five pillars. How do you get, uh, what is sustainable, planet sustainability is about air, water, and then now the third key factor is land. So uh, when we are setting up a tourism operation, how are we treating our land? And waste is a very important component. And uh, we, of course, we are doing the waste segregation and disposal. Bath water is, is being is sent through uh, coal line soak pits, uh, toilet waste disposal through septic tanks. But the important part is what are the kind of chemicals we are using uh, in our lodge uh, or rooms and operations. And so we, we, we have, I mean, you could say that we are a zero chemical property in that sense that all our sprays, toiletries, crop, uh, laundry uh, chemicals, are they all natural organic products. And even the bin liners are made from cornstarch, which can be sent to the compost pit directly uh, without and uh, com uh, get composted in the due course of time. Of course, a zero single use plastic policy using RO water, filter water, bamboo uh, packaging for food and beverages, and uh, bamboo based toilet rolls and napkins, uh, and uh, bamboo based toothbrushes on request. So, reducing the toxicity that uh, go, uh, goes into operating a hotel or a lodge. It is be a building. Which uh, a sustainable uh, a sustainable building is also a very important aspect of uh, an eco tourism operation or a responsible tourism operation. And also, what percentage of your of your land area are you uh, put, putting under construction? So at our end, we just have about two percent of our land area and which is constructed or uh, curated. So even lawn areas get counted in that. We recycle building materials uh, from within the lodge and around and use local building materials for any new construction that uh, has taken place over the years. Even uh, furniture and furnishings have been repurposed. So old, uh, not really antique, but old pieces of furniture from across the country have been sourced and then refurbished to be used at the lodge. And of course, uh, our food is sourced now. So the destination uh, or a sustainable tourism operation is the impact on the community. And of course, uh, we do, uh, like so many other places, we, uh, all our team members are from the local community. And of course, uh, the consumables in the kitchens are sourced directly from local farmers. But then I went back to my balance sheet to see how does it really translate into pure economic numbers. And I was able to calculate that uh, my, out of my total revenue, 67% of the outflow is goes back to the local community that is within 10 to 15 kilometers uh, of the lodge operations. And another important aspect of uh, impact on community is that uh, that's the sense of well-being, whether it comes in or not. And uh, as I said at the start of the talk, that uh, Chambal as a destination was known for all, had a, a very low self-esteem about ourselves and the rest of the world also didn't think very highly of us. But 25 years of uh, tourism in Chambal with, after having hosted two international bird fairs with a representation from almost 29 countries and uh, tourists, uh, hundreds and thousands of tourists coming away over the years, the local community feels very uh, proud about the fact that now they are on the global map for bird watching tourism and ecotourism. This is a picture of our team, and this is one of our guests interacting with local school children. Also, uh, the, the very important aspect of a sustainable uh, destination is 
that uh, how does conservation of uh, the natural and the built heritage gets impacted by the tourism operation? And this is a very, very sensitive area because we've seen uh, in, across the country several examples of destinations getting ruined because of over-tourism, because of uh, irresponsible practices, uh, absence of carrying capacity studies. And that's where uh, at Chambal, we were fortunate that at the very beginning of uh, of the tourism operation, a, a tourism management plan was put into place, and we did a self uh, assessment of the carrying capacity of uh, to boats on the Chambal River, and that has led to uh, a very positive impact. That uh, when we started our uh, with our boats on the Chambal River, there used to be maybe one or two nesting sites in that area. And last census uh, in 2022, uh, in 23, put the number at five nesting sites. So this, the number of nesting sites in a riverine habitat is a, uh, is a key indicator of the health of the habitat. And so I feel that our operation or the tourism operation in the Chambal region is sustainable uh, as the, the wildlife is thriving. And, the, and also there is, it's not, it has not led to any behavioral change um, uh, in the signature species that is the gadial or the uh, marsh crocodile and so this journey as we go went along uh, we also wanted to uh, so this is one of the photographs from the river and then these are the calculations which i will skip through but if, if there are any questions related to the, that i'll come back to these slides So somewhere down the line, about six to seven years ago, we decided to increase the footprint of our uh, ecotourism operation. And that couldn't have been done by increasing the number of tourists coming in, because then uh, we started would have started working against the very principles which we stood for. So we incorporated a, uh, an organization called Chambal Agritech Incubator with the brand Wild Chambal and started engaging with uh, local farmers in improving uh, the agriculture around here and making it more responsible. And so uh, coined a phrase called uh, climate compatible agriculture, where we started uh, looking at interacting with local farmers and trying to make their agriculture profitable, but at the same time, less water consumptive and less uh, chemical consumptive and uh, introducing uh, crops which are uh, uh, sort of uh, have uh, bring in more economic value without uh, causing any environmental degradation. And in that process, we realized that uh, olive uh, plant uh, cultivation could be uh, brought into the area uh, as uh, olive. Most of us would associate olives with uh, the Mediterranean, but it's a it's a it's a Sanskrit name is Jaitul and has been is, is existed in India in the Northern Plains for thousands of years. So it was very easy to reintroduce the crop and uh, we're making a tea from the leaves of the plant and uh, fruiting would happen soon and olive oil would follow. So this is a 600 plus farmer cooperative uh, in what you could say, or a FPO or a farmer producer organization. <laughs> and as a natural corollary to this, uh, our ne next step in this direction is to set up Indian School of Nature which is a school, which is number one, it's going to be an open source knowledge platform and uh, in the field of uh, planet sustainability. And it will, we also intend to resurrect local knowledge practices and traditions and not just blindly follow uh, West, West dictated uh, environmental uh, policies and uh, knowledge. And so in that uh, sense, we are looking at setting up this institute with its own dedicated campus and uh, in the field of environment and wildlife conservation, climate smart and compatible agriculture, sustainable development and mitigating oblique adapting to climate change, renewable energy and sustainable travel. So that's the future we are headed to in the Chambal region. And some more details about our guiding principles at the Indian School of Nature. So, Thank you, and this is uh, 
the end of this uh, uh, presentation. So uh, I'd like to welcome Correct. Akanksha Garg, uh, you know, who's actually the director for the Waxpol and uh, Waxpol Industries. And she is uh, she's a fantastic entrepreneur who has uh, an, a big influencer as well. She runs three properties of her own, which are also based on, on sustainable uh, criteria. So five, oh. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry to say that five, okay. Uh, so so I will invite her uh, to give a brief uh, kind of introduction to her pinch uh, property and the area. Mm. A very good afternoon to everyone. And I know it's a very cold morning afternoon now and uh, the sun is not as bright as it was last week so quickly i'm going to take you all through a brief presentation on what is the wildlife sightings in Pench national park and what work we are doing there with regard to sustainability so now generally when people think about Pench, Pench actually expands to two parts of uh, the country that is maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh is the same park. It's known as Priya Darshani National Park and the Pench National Park on the other side. The Madhya Pradesh side has a larger, flatter land and it is better for night safaris and it is also good for morning and afternoon safaris. So this picture which you can see on the back, this is the kind of accommodation that we have with very large windows, with solar panels on the top, for heating the water required in the rooms. We have non-CFC generating air conditioners that are being used in the room. And as you can see, this river, this, which is a non-perennial river known as River Pajdhar, it flows um, in front of the property of all of our river view rooms and it's clearly visible from the deck. So in the summer months, if you look at the right hand side, you can see a small pond. We create this natural pond where we see a lot of wildlife come in to drink water. Why Pench? Why not any other national park? What is the story behind it? It's really true about Mowgli. Um, so, you know, all these questions do come up. And when we are looking at marketing a destination, it's very important to understand what is the basis of the place. So it is true that a man child was found living with the wolves in his younger days. And this uh, pamphlet was actually written by Sir William Henry Sleeman in 1931 which was actually procured by Rudyard Tipley, who's actually never been to Pench or Ghana in his lifetime. And he wrote the story Jungle Book. So when we look at the characters of the Jungle Book, which are the animals that we really see? Just a minute, I'm not able to change my page. This is just the statistics of how big the park is. I'm not going into detail here. What kind of a forest is uh, Pench? It's so very interesting that three types of forests that are found in Pench. One is the tropical dry deciduous mixed forest, the tropical wet deciduous forest, and the tropical dry peak forest. So what it becomes very interesting that you always have a certain amount of green. It may be on the, in, the, in the form of grassland. It may be in the form of leaves. It may be in the form of uh, letting different habitats grow. And one of the main economic uh, and very important tree in the state of Madhya Pradesh is the Mahua tree. This tree provides oil to the locals once the seed is dried. It is also edible and uh, the locals use it to make uh, Mahua halwa. They also make alcohol out of this, which is very popular. And recently, the state of Madhya Pradesh has launched the Mahua alcohol, which is legally sold at all the liquor shops. It's very interesting because it's giving encouragement to the locals to have its own, um, you know, their own state liquor. And uh, it's giving it a rightful channel to be sold. So it helps in the economic development of the local people, which are basically from the Gon tribe. And then most of them are, of course, uh, local from Madhya Pradesh as well, especially the ones that are living in the Pench region. Another very interesting tree uh, which you will see in Pench here, if you notice, I'm just not focusing on the wildlife because when you're going to any national park, it's very important to absorb what all that park is offering you. Uh, it's known as a ghost tree. This interesting tree changes color, uh, the bark changes color with the seasons and it's, it has a natural gum which is extracted by the locals, which is known as karaya. So at times when you find the gond uh, ladu, 
or the gone which is used for sticking locally or for medicinal purposes is actually found from the tree. In the months of um, monsoon, the, the, the tree is completely pink, then it stays green, and in the summer months, it becomes completely white. Also, what is interesting is that the forest gives us so much. If you look at the palash flowers, the amaltas, and the semal, the palash flowers are used by the locals uh, for playing holi. And what we've started doing at the Riverwood Forest Retreat is we've started soaking and drying these flowers and making natural colors whenever we are celebrating the festival of holi in the national park with our guests. When we look at the fauna of Peng, there are 40 species of mammals. They are very large species of reptiles and amphibians, birds, and butterflies. And to cater to these animals, what we've done at the property itself is we have created a butterfly garden where we have all the species living. And what happens with that is we've noticed that up our, our, our property, which was completely barren when we uh, bought the place back in 2009, is a complete green cover. So if you look at it and on the Google map, you will not be able to see our accommodations at all. It's completely green. It does give us a challenge in terms of the solar water heaters which we are using. That's why we've kept the solar water heaters on a direction where there's not a lot of overshadow coming from the larger trees. Most of the clients which come to Pench generally come to see the tiger or the leopard. But we have a very good and healthy population of the wild dogs. We have approximately five to six packs which are easily sighted. Uh, currently, the sightings are of pack sizes of two to six. And then slot bears are mostly found more on the Chinwara side or the Jamtara side. Um, and the grey wolf sightings are fantastic uh, where we are located near the Kothar forest part um, near Kwasa. We can see a uh, wolf pack of generally one, uh, sometimes a single one or maybe two or three operating in the region. We heard a lot about the melanistic leopard, you know, the Bagheera, who's Bagheera. So when we, I go back to the story of Mowgli, the Black Panther was actually the melanistic leopard that was, has been found in the Pent region for many, many years. Uh, Sher Khan, of course, the Royal Bengal Tiger itself. Um, then you have the Bandar Logs, which were the Langoos and the Rhesus Macaques, uh, the Sambar Deer, uh, we have the Spotted Deer, the Sambar Deer, the Blue Bull, which is the largest uh, in the species. And of course, the Boar Goris or uh, the Indian Boar, uh, very frequently sighted on the grasslands while you're driving in from the Turiya Gate. Or if you're even going to the other Maharashtra side, I think... Pench has that one big facility that you can go to multiple gates, even if you're staying anywhere in the Pench or Maharashtra site. Um, and the distance from our property to the gates is approximately 20 minutes. Uh, what we do encourage our clients to do is not only focus on the early morning and the late evening safaris, but also try and go for a night safari. Uh, we do not guarantee any tiger sightings, but there have been tiger and leopard sightings there. I would say approximately a 40% chance. But more than that, it's very interesting because you can see the species that are nocturnal, like the crested uh, porcupine. Indian pangolin has very rare sighting, maybe one in a couple of years. It's sighted because it's really small. It likes to stay in the deep jungle. Then you have the Indian flying squirrel, which you can also see at a property and along with the palm servet. Other than this, you can also see the Indian uh, black naped hare. And you can see... Uh, you know, herds of the herbivores which I had shown before. The state bird of Madhya Pradesh is the paradise flycatcher. And many times people get confused. Why should we come to Pench? Only for the tiger, only for the animals, only for the trees. You can also come here for great birding. You have a huge influx of migratory birds all the way from November to late February. And in this time, you can also come and see the flyer catcher, which is rufous when it's born with plumage and long for the tail, but after 18 months, they become completely white. Yeah. Um, for birding, of course, these are the other birds that you can see very frequently. And what we have done to protect them at our resort is we've grown a lot of indigenous fruit trees and uh, some, of course, some there's some foreign fruit trees as well, which have been approved by the forest department, so that they can encourage the bird life to stay within the park and not really go towards the small rural cities. In the nighttime, while we are going for the night safari, you can see a large variety of, uh, you know, owls. 
And uh, you can see the rock eagle, all the mortal wood owls, bound all the Indian scops are very easily sighted during morning safaris, or the jungle owlet, which is the only one that is awake in the mornings. Along with this, the sighting of the white from vulture has gone up. So it's very good news. I think uh, the vulture health denotes how good what how good the health of the park is. And uh, that's what we've been able to see. There's been certain groups uh, that are growing and the sightings are mostly towards the Alicata side of the park, along with the oriental honey buzzard, the shikra, the white-eyed buzzard, and the crested serpent eagle. What I've also noticed in the last couple of years, I haven't shown any scorpion pictures here, but there is a certain group of clientele which wants to come and see the snakes. Though we don't really encourage them to uh, to go for snake sighting because it, it can be very fatal. But in the villages, one can definitely listen to the stories of the score scale vipers or the crate, common crate, and how they are found in the village side and how people you know, interact with them, how do they handle them, how their lives are. And these stories are very interesting. These are some of the other snakes that are found easily. Other than this, we have a butterfly guy, like, which I've just mentioned. I will just quickly show you a picture of it after this. And these are some common insects of pench, which are very popular with our photographers as well. For example, the beaver ant. Uh, you will notice that they clump together leaves and they take out a paste and they actually join them and make it into the home on top of the trees. And they're very easily sighted. And if you are lucky enough and you observe carefully on an open ground, at times you can find a beaver ant and a black ant fighting. And generally the beaver ant wins because it's got really, really strong cause webs. Um, the praying mantis can be very easily seen uh, in the park during the summer months because they're very visible with the uh, with the dry background. And other than that, it's very good to hear the cicada sound in the night. While you're staying at the resort as well, these are the certain amount of wildlife that you can see there. These are the big five of Kench, which are easily seen and are very popular for the park. I would like to mention a couple of things when I'm talking about the wildlife here. Uh, Ritu, can I quickly show that quick uh, presentation to screen through it? Hello, think, Ritu. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, can I? We, can we I? would like to have a like. A, are you finished? Your presentation is finished. No, can I? Can I just quickly show them this particular page about what quick work we are doing? For the sustainability aspect, okay. it'll just very take two quickly. more minutes. Yeah, 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 very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So what we have done at Waxball over the years is we always work with the local community and we work with the local schools in the areas that we are operating. So we have uh, actually completely built up the infrastructure of approximately six schools in Madhya Pradesh, and along that, something like this where you can see we've installed a TV to help in education, built up. Uh, put up sw swings, um, made a toilet for the boys and girls separately. We've developed a boundary wall around the school so that the children don't come into any accident while they're playing, along with setting up a facility for a sports library and a books library. So all these initiatives, what the main change was that the children, instead of going to the fields to work, they started coming to school and getting educated. And we've given the responsibility to our staff to actually manage uh, that tenders of the teacher. Along with this, what we've also done is we've put up these signs all around the property uh, so that we can educate the next generation about the use of plastic, the importance of wildlife, the importance of termites, and how important every single species has in the ecosystem. So that's just some of the signs that educate them. And on the left-hand side, you can see the work that we are doing with the local villages where we are supplying them with tables and chairs, and these are not only the government schools that we are supplying to, but also the single man run schools where we are supplying them with educational material, both in Hindi and English, and along with storybooks. To educate our guests, we've actually developed these guidebooks, which is a wildlife bench national park and on our other parks and along with the local festivals, so that whenever your traveler is planning to go to a region, he's able to understand what information is available, what will they be experiencing at that time, and it really helps them have a complete, um, you know, uh, understanding of what the region has to offer. These are the kind of signages that we put around in our butterfly garden. 
and along the whole roadway from where the highway gets over all the way to a resort, wherever there is an animal crossing area, we have actually marked it out on the road with these reflective signages so that people uh, so that people don't drive um, you know very fast and they are able to be aware that it's a wildlife zone one is to be very cautious of course employing locals has always been a part of our ethos when we, when we started with the sundarban tiger camp we started all the way with employing the local bandits and poachers and now they're the conservationists of the forest the same thing was used here by employing the locals from the villages and training them with hospitality with the help of the hotel school um, IHM Bhopal. Uh, along with this, what we also do is we're trying to ensure that the local culture remains the same. For example, somebody's involved in farming, we want them to continue to be a farmer. So what we do is we, we take our guests to the picking areas, we take them to the villages where they have these small orchards and we help you, uh, you know, with your first hand, pick up the uh, pick up the lemon or the oranges, or maybe if you want to go for the pottery experience, you can go to the Pajdhar village and learn pottery firsthand. Whenever we have the local festival, we take a guest for a walk so they can see how the cows and other animals are worshipped by the locals and why are they even coloring the house in a green color or red color and how it helps them. Here, early, not we don't do the Mahua walk very early morning because at times it can be very dangerous. Uh, in terms of sloth bears and other animals coming to eat it. But at around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, we take them for a walk uh, to show the mahua pickers and how they're drying the mahua and selling them in the market for a means of earning. Along with this, we also thought that it's very important to educate our travelers with how what kind of impact they are putting on the destination. And for this, we design the responsible traveler guidelines and we circulate them with our guests. And... Along with this, for our agents and for our guests, we have developed these specialized itineraries after the sustainable development goals were announced by the UN, which shows that for every single itinerary you take with us, what are the sustainable development goals you're covering? And to further understand it, this brochure goes into detail about how are we reaching it, how are we reaching zero hunger, how are we reaching quality education, gender, gender equality, are we doing something with sustainability? So if you connect what is written in the SDG section below with the master sheet, you're able to understand where, what are we offering. Yeah. And along with this, Akansha, what we've sorry, also done like this, to, we'll need, need to have a question and answer session also. So I I'm like just to, done. So yeah. this is it. This is the end. And uh, we've also updated our website to provide all this information to all our guests. So it's yeah. just not about talking greenwashing. It's all there. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Kangsha. Thank you, RP. It was, uh, I think, very uh, informative, very educational. Uh, so if we have any questions, I will really request the audiences to come. I mean, new, new kind of information which everybody's got. So uh, feel free, please, uh, to come forward and ask questions. But uh, Ramsar, before uh, anybody asks, I'll take the opportunity since I'm talking. <laughs> you know, so I'm very, sure. very intrigued by the, the Indian school of, uh, you know, the, the Indian school, uh, nature school that you, uh, has it already started or are you, what, what is it, what stage are you on for that? So there are two parallel processes here. Uh, Indian school of nature, as far as knowledge uh, generation and uh, knowledge sharing uh, is, is concerned, has started. But we also intend to build a dedicated green campus, uh, about 50 acres for which we are acquiring the land and that construction, et cetera, over, would happen over the next three to five years. Uh, but what we have started at the moment are learning exchange programs. So we did one with the, the tour leaders for the wildlife uh, parks uh, across the country. We did one such learning program, learning exchange program in the month of September. Uh, now, for the coming months, we are planning a learning exchange workshop on climate compatible agriculture with the farmers from states of UP and MP. So it will be in two batches of uh, 12 to 15 farmers each time. So the impact programs have started. And uh, okay. but the yes, the, it's a big project and it will take its own time to take shape. 
Okay. Uh, but is there any like online portal for anybody to go on to and kind of thing? It's, it's under construction. It's, 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 it's under construction. And as I said in my presentation, so uh, the unique concept about ISN is that it's it's going to be a completely open source knowledge platform where anybody could log in and uh, look look at the, I mean, the knowledge would be shared. So the revenue doesn't come from knowledge. That's where we have tried to make it very different from what exists at the moment. Yeah. That's interesting, really interesting, because we don't have something like that at all. So to initiate that, I think it would really be kind of um, good and very, I mean, something uh, we could we could learn. I mean, so that's a great initiative. Congratulations for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Akanksha, there is one question for you. Yeah. Over here that uh, uh, we want to know the road distance and arrangements from Nagpur to Pench uh, from Pramod. So hi Pramod, I think one of the easiest, uh, one of the easiest parks to get to in India, considering that most of the parks take a, a two, a three to four hour drive. Uh, it's a two hour drive uh, from Pench to Nagpur, and you have a national highway with uh, very unique wildlife underpasses. So I think that's one of the most uh, fantastic things about it. And uh, you can travel any time of the day. Uh, we generally recommend uh, driving times from five o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night to be on the road, not very late, just to avoid road accidents. Because we do know a lot of travelers uh, prefer to take late night flights and drive in, but keeping safety into mind yeah, this is the times when I would recommend. I want to ask both of you. I mean, both of you were actually certified by TOFT. So do you think undergoing the TOFT certification helped you in any way? Um, was was that process instrumental in getting you a kind of a to-go factor towards sustainability? Ram, sir? Or, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was Ram. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. So certification gives us... Uh, so we all... I think in the fraternity, we are all well-minded about trying to incorporate sustainable practices in our operations. But when the certification team comes in, it's it's a great opportunity for us to learn, discuss, debate uh, our practices with them. So it's actually like a learning exchange uh, program again, and uh, that uh, it leaves uh, both sides enriched and also the top team is then able to, uh, so the audit team is able, able to pick up some practices from A location and then see if it can be implemented in location B. So uh, I think uh, it's a great uh, opportunity for all the top members to go for certification. Absolutely. That's the whole idea. We, in fact, have created a good resource, uh, you know, good practices uh, toolkit, which is there on our website as well. So the point is that to share it with everybody and every person, every location is unique. They bring in their own uh, benefits. And that's what oh, the team, I think, encourages also. What has been your take? What is your take on Twitter, Kancha? I definitely agree with the top certification because, you know, uh, we were doing so much work. And uh, one of the biggest drawbacks was that we were not documenting it earlier. Because we thought, you know, if we're talking about it, it means we are bragging and that's not something that one needed to do. But once we started listing things down, we got to know that we're doing so much more and it adds mm. so much value to the ecosystem, to the environment. And uh, yeah, it, it and once uh, the top, of course, once you went for the recertification, how it really helped us was that you guys had already gone and done some certifications elsewhere and gotten better ideas about doing things in a different way which was feasible, more sustainable, and we were able to implement those changes. So uh, definitely yes. uh, a do, definitely. So absolutely. It's like, a. I mean, I always say it's like a roadmap you give to yourself and then you assess every three three months. So it's like a to-do list that you get through the report also that you're able to, you know, apply it. Some, I, and and uh, so so um, I definitely encourage everybody and thank you for supporting us totally for that. So uh, there is a gentleman over here who is wanting any suggestions for the Panna National Park. Uh, we uh, just we Khan. Uh, so any suggestions uh, uh, through your experience you could give for the uh, yes, Sarai, think exactly. Tori, yeah. uh -huh. I think I think if you're looking at accommodation, sustainable would be Sarai by Toria. That's yeah. what we can recommend. 
Yeah. Sorry, you can come online if you have any specific. It's a very broad question, actually speaking. So what exactly are you, you know, you have in kind of mind? I mean, uh, would you like to come forward or without the video also or talk about it um, to give give you a better specific idea as to and, and and if you say that there is, uh, you know, the, these days there's also destination management uh, schemes which are there, certifications rather, which the the park authorities or the or the government authorities they can take care of. In fact, Toft now has a tie up with green destinations. Green destinations again is a certification which happens on a destination, which again a roadmap which is provided to the destinations where all stakeholders come together. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's um, for the thing. But it's the people who come out, actually, you know, who can really make a difference. It's the people who make the difference to each destination, I think. And uh, Ramsar and Kangsha would agree on to it that, you know, how working in the destination, you were able to collaborate and you were able to, like, really make the destinations what it is. I mean, you know, uh, whether it's Pench or where, where uh, whether Ramsar is concerned. Hmm. Uh, Ram, please. Yeah, no, I just want to uh, uh, add something here. So when we're looking at uh, when, when you're looking at inbound travel, travelers are coming in and they're doing multiple destinations. So at uh, Indian School of Nature, under the Travel Sustainable Vertical, we have developed an algorithm where we try to see the to build a zero uh, carbon itinerary. Uh, for while traveling through Indian wild areas. And uh, just to quickly go through that, the biggest uh, culprit on uh, any travel itinerary is the flight. That takes in about 300 plus uh, points uh, out of 1,000 points, if you put that as a, a barometer. And now you have 700 points left to uh, uh, sort of offset that using uh, destinations and lodges uh, that are sinking in carbon and uh, you have a zero carbon and a... Uh, and a water positive itinerary uh, at the end of eight or 15 days. So that's the that's where we want to really want to collaborate with uh, lodges across the wildscape in India to see how we can offer these kind of itineraries. To, and uh, trust me, this 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 summer when I was in Europe, uh, the customers are, or the travelers are already asking about what exactly, how much is the carbon footprint of their travel to India or, or what is their impact on the community. So it's very soon these questions will start coming to us through our travel agents and DMC. So there's a great opportunity here for Indian wildlife tourism operations. So how are you calculating your carbon footprint currently? Are you using any tool? So we, yeah, so there's part of the presentation. So that's basically uh, in, like by the number of trees and different uh, varieties of trees sink in different amount of carbon uh, per annum. And then you uh, get into the calculation of how much are you actually producing? So have if for or a daily operation at the lodge, what's your fuel that's going in into your generator, or what kind of if you're doing campfire, what kind of carbon you're generating out of that, or your kitchen gas, etc. So everything there is there are set formulas that are shared in the presentation, and this these the, and it's it's an open document and uh, lodges can start uh, working in their own way. I mean I'm not saying exact it has to be followed to the last T, yeah, but they can yeah. work around it and create maybe better options. Yeah. So travel life also, which is another representation which Toft has done, which is uh, for the travel for travel agents, but they have a tool, uh, Kamakel, okay, which again yes. calculates uh, the carbon footprint, and it's an independent tool which could be actually be bought. I mean, they haven't started doing it, but in due course they'll start doing it, and and but travel agents get it as as a complimentary thing. Uh, for a for certain number of itineraries, yeah. they get it for that, uh, you know, for their itineraries, they can calculate. Mm. Yeah. Sophie, you have, do you have any question? Mm. Uh, you're, you're, you're muted. No, my my only addition is the thing that I'm, I bang on about a lot, which to, um, to encourage longer stays in single destinations to reduce carbon footprint. Uh, the, you know, the international flight is unavoidable, but um, people spending three, two or three nights in, in each place and then driving around in a, in a car or taking multiple flights is obviously disastrous. And, um, and one of the brilliant things about Mela Koti is how much 
how much you have to offer and I can't just mention it as well but offering offering um more than just wildlife so that you can yeah you can hold people in one place for for six or seven nights and I, th I think that's completely feasible for a place that, that you have someone come from Europe and they just stay in two you know literally two locations in in a, in a two-week stay but um yeah really impressed with what RP has been doing I, had, I hadn't been aware of the extent of your work at all um yeah so yeah hats off yeah, great. thank you Thanks, yeah. I would mm. just like to add one thing. You know, since you're talking about carbon neutral, uh, net zero calculating emissions, uh, there are now toolkits that are available where we can monitor. So what happens is you have to monitor one room occupied per day, right? Mm. And then you have a look at how much is being used and then look at a full occupancy day. So you get an average of the emissions out. And there is an Excel sheet which is available now. Like you, like you mentioned, we've a travel life that is for tour operators, but this is also available for accommodation. And the okay. main thing that you're actually collecting, uh, you know, uh, calculating in that is the electricity, the fuel that is used in transportation, your safaris, getting from point A to point B, along with your sourcing of vegetables from where, how far are you getting it? Just to get an idea, you know, if you're buying something which is locally available for 10 rupees, and if you're getting for 20 rupees in the market, you can understand the power, carbon footprint. It's approximately 10 rupees. So you can think the value of 10 rupees worth of fuel, which gets added onto that particular vegetable. And mm. then they are looking at how are you handling your waste? So, you know, we initially started, we compost, we've been composting all our natural waste, all our food products with a biocomposter. But the biggest challenge uh, which we've had uh, of late has been packaging which you mm -hmm. get in terms of the food packaging because you have to ensure a certain quality is given to the people. Like, for example, I can buy dal if it's locally manufactured from the local farmer. I can buy rice if it's locally manufactured, but for something like wheat, which is not manufactured locally, I may need to go to our ITC or another brand which is established in the market. So handling that, what we did this was, uh, we gave an initiative to a kabadi wala that we will not take any money from you. We will collect it, pack it up. So you take it completely back, free of cost for recycling. I think, you know, all of us need to encourage this kind of rec recycling yeah. where you don't get anything and you are able to collect it all together. And another main challenge which we are going to be facing, especially in central India, because the water table is reducing. Uh, mm. Water crisis is a future reality, is um, the use of a sewage treatment plant. Now, what we've seen in the cities is that you are using these really big sewage treatment plants, which are now, which are very expensive to man. You need a lot of electricity to man it. So there are newer brands which are available, which are decentralized, which can be run with solar, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it has a six hour turnaround and the wastewater that comes out is very uh, nitrogen rich and phosphorus uh, rich. So it's very good for your planting. So if you do drip irrigation with that, with the wastewater for your plantation, you are actually reducing your reliance on freshwater usage. And it helps in increasing the water table as well. So, you know, it just sounds, yeah. so being aware of such new innovations or such new products, I think that's the lack which is there. And, and I think if we have, uh, if you, uh, Akanksha, if you have a list of such kind of, uh, you know, new products or Ramsar, if, yeah. if you have, we could maybe collate it and, you know, probably share it with the community because at the end of the day, a lot of people want to do good things, but there is, there's, they simply didn't, do, they're not aware of it, you know, so I think uh, this could be one thing that we could, yeah, yes, yes, please go ahead. Mm. Yeah, so we, we have a list of uh, green vendors who write okay. from people who supply the, the mosquito repellents to, to toiletries, to laundry, laundry soaps, etc., which are all organic in nature and chemical free. So we, I'll share that with you and then you can share it with well, it would be the fantastic. top. I think, it, yeah, and, it would uh, be fantastic to do that. Yeah. Also, absolutely. just to add quickly add to that, we are in the process of getting, a, getting into collaboration with an organization called Development Alternatives, which is into uh, making sustainable buildings. 
So when new lodges are coming up or when old lodges are going into renovation or expansion, uh, DA is available. To, I mean, and they are again a non not for profit organization. So they are they they are developing uh, in the process of developing technology that can be. Uh, I mean, for making your buildings, you can use local materials and uh, technologies, uh, and the, and those would be green buildings. So that's something which is going to be available very soon to the new lodge owners or to the existing community also. Great. I mean, that's fantastic to know. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So thank you so much. So I think we've kind of overshot. We generally keep it to like 30 to 40 minutes, but uh, I think uh, there was an interest. And uh, so thank you for all the knowledge which you have shared, uh, Ramsar, Akanksha, and uh, Sophie, and everybody joining us today. Uh, thank you for being and uh, sharing your knowledge.